Hey there, students, and welcome to part two of the New York uh, Regents exam algebra two trig, um, January 2012. Um, release questions. Uh, this packet I'm going through are available online. It's available online um, on the on nysed dot nysed regents.org. Um, I'll advise you to view part one of this video. Just click down here to view part one, um, and hopefully this uh, sequence of problems I go over help you get ready for for the next exam. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, question 11. It says, when x to the negative 1 plus 1 is divided by x plus 1, the quotient equals. So one thing I need you to remember is that the whole idea of quotient, quotient means uh, divide. Okay, so we're going to be dividing this by x plus 1. All right? So if I divide x plus if I divide, if I, I want to do x to the negative 1 plus 1, I want to divide it by, um, I want to divide it by x plus 1. Okay? So before I do that, how about I simplify this as much as possible? Alright, I'm going to simplify this and then I'll divide it, alright? So, focusing on just this part right here, x to the negative 1 plus 1. What does a negative, negative power mean? It means you need to reciprocate, okay? So I can put a 1 under here. And then this negative means this needs to be reciprocated. So the 1 goes to the top, x goes to the bottom. And you can have 1 over x plus 1. Okay? Now, can I combine these two? Can I combine this fraction and this whole number right here? Absolutely. What I need to do is make this into a fraction. Now, what is the LCD of x and 1? The LCD of x and 1 is x, right? So I need the denominators to be the same so I can combine the fractions. So I'll times this by x so that the denominators are identical. All right, so what we end up with is um, 1 over x plus x over x. Since the denominators are the same, I can combine them into 1. So I have 1 plus x, uh, 1 plus x over x, all right? And I can use the reflexive property of addition. You now, the committed the property of addition to rewrite this as x plus 1 over x because addition commits, okay? So this is equivalent to that piece right there. So now the problem has been uh, modified slightly. So now we're going to be doing x plus 1 over x divided by x plus 1. All right? So how do we divide? Well, I can express this as a fraction, x plus 1 over 1. Now division is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I can rewrite this as x plus 1 over x times the reciprocal of this, because that's what division is multiplying by the reciprocal. So I reciprocate this, I'll have 1 over x plus 1. All right? Now, um, can I reduce? Absolutely. You see that x plus 1 here goes here once. x plus 1 goes here once. If you multiply across, you're going to have 1 over x. All right? And that's your final answer. So the answer to question 1 is option 2. All right, let's move on to question 12. Um, it says, the amount of time students work on in any given week is normally distributed with a mean of 10 hours per week. What is the standard, I mean, 10, hour, 10 hours per week, and the standard deviation of two hours? What is the probability that a student works between 8 and 12 hours per week? So in order to do this, you need to uh, consult your um, standard deviation chart on the reference sheets that's included uh, for you in the in the packet. So that's basically what I'm going to be using. All right. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Scroll down. Uh, where are you? This is what I'm going to be using right here. All right. You see this? Standard deviation curve right here. I'm going to be using this to solve the problem. Okay, so notice how it's it's uh, broken down by half of a standard deviation to the left and to the right. All right, every every tick mark is um, half of a standard deviation. All right, so let's go ahead and use that for uh, this problem. So what I need to do first of all is draw a line, and I'm going to calibrate it. Okay, so this is my line right here. This, the midpoint, that's the mean, okay? That's the mean. In this case, uh, the mean is, um, oh, let's take that off. The mean is what? 10 hours, right? So this is the mean right here. 
The mean is 10 hours. Okay, that's what your mean is. Now, I'm not going to draw the curve. You can look at it on your chart and you understand what I'm trying to say, all right? So this is 10 right here. So um, remember, if you look at the way it's broken down, every tick mark is half of a half of a standard deviation, half of a standard deviation, okay? So this is going to be uh, negative 0.5 of a standard deviation, and then this is going to be negative 1 of a standard deviation, and then going this direction, this is uh, negative 0.5, of, I mean, I'm sorry, positive 0.5 of a standard deviation, and um, the next guy is going to be one standard deviation, all right? So, um, now, let's see. If you look at the problem, the standard deviation is two hours, right? If the standard deviation, if one standard deviation, one standard deviation, if it's um, equal to two hours, then half of a standard deviation is going to be what? Half is going to be one hour, right? So every tick mark here corresponds to one hour. So this is 10 going to the left. Every tick is half of a standard, which is an hour. So this is 10. Subtract 1. This is going to be um, 9. And this is going to be 8. Okay? And then going to the right, this is 10. This is half a standard deviation, which is an hour. This is going to be 11. So what we're going to be looking at is the probability percentages between 1, 2, 3. These three intervals right here. All right? So if you take a look at your chart, um, you notice that to the left, two... All right, one full standard deviation to the left, which corresponds to two hours, we have 19.1 and 15. And then half a standard deviation to the right, we have 19.1%. Okay? So let's uh, put that in here. So um, I put it in blue. So for this first half a standard deviation, is 19.1% probability. And then in this case right here, is also 19.1%. And then the other one is, um, oh boy, I forgot, Let's see, what is it, 15%, okay, so this one is 15%, all right, so with this information, I should be able to calculate the uh, probability that um, signal works between, between 8 and 11 hours, okay, all right, so how do we do that, all you just simply do is you just add all these percentages together and that will give you the answer. So you're going to have 15% plus 19.1 plus 19.1 and if you add everything together you're going to end up with 53.2% and that's your that's the answer. So just note in this problem every hour is not a standard deviation. Every hour is actually half of a standard deviation so you got to be careful. All right so we're going one standard deviation to the left and half a standard deviation to the right. All right? So there goes your answer, is three. All right, moving along to question 13. It says, what is a conjugate? Whenever you, con if you have a complex number given by A plus BI, the conjugate happens when you take the opposite of the imaginary component, all right? The opposite of the imaginary component. So if this is plus BI, the conjugate is simply going to be a minus bi. All right. If you had um, a minus bi, then the conjugate, the conjugate, oops, not trying to spell. The conjugate, the conjugate um, is going to be the opposite of the imaginary component, which is a plus bi. So that's what you want to do. Just focus your energy on the imaginary part. Okay. So let's take a look at this problem. To find a conjugate, all we look at is just the imaginary part. Since it's positive, two over two i. The conjugate, the conjugate is going to be 1 over 2 minus 3 over 2i. Alright, so the answer for option 13 is 2. Alright, we're going to look to 14. It says given an um, given angle A is in quadrant 1, um, it's on A as equals 12 over 13, and angle B is in quadrant 2, with cosine B equals negative 3 over 5. What is the value of cosine A minus B? So before we start, um, let's break down cosine of A minus B first. So using the difference identity, what is cosine A minus B? 
if you look at your reference sheet, it's already included for you there, so you don't really have to memorize it, but it's good to know how to memorize anyway. So this is what I'm going to be using here. The pattern for cosine is that the, the trig function stays the same and the sine is opposite, all right? Uh, and then for sine, the trig functions are different and the sine stays the same. That's memory aid I normally use. All right, so for this one, it's uh, basically going to be, using the formula we just looked at, uh, cosine A, cosine B, the trig function stays the same and the sine is opposite, plus sine A, sine B, all right? So you notice that for this, to work this out, we need four ingredients. We need cosine A, cosine B, sine A, and sine B, all right? So what is cosine A? We know that cosine A is, I don't know, what is sine A? Sine A is 12 over 13, good. And then um, cosine B, cosine B is negative 3 over 5, and um, sine B, is I don't know. So we need to find cosine a and sine b in order to work out this problem. All right. So let's start out by finding uh, by finding what cosine a is. All right. So how do we find cosine a? Well, we're going to use an identity, the Pythagorean identity. We know that uh, sine square a plus cosine square a equals what? equals unity equals one all right so using just the a's i'm going to plug in my sine a in here and find out what cosine a is all right so sine a is going to be 12 over 13 square plus cosine square a equals one if i simplify that i'm going to have 144 over 169 plus cosine square a equals one okay now let's get cosine a by itself. I subtract um, 144 over 169 from both sides, and you're going to have you're going to have um, cosine square a equals one minus 144 over 169 over one. Oh yeah, can't write that anymore. 144 over 169. Now, uh, what we're going to do here is express these two numbers as a fraction. So 1 over 1 minus 144 over 169. So what's the LCD of 1 and 169? It's 169, right? So to make the denominators identical, our times is our 169, top and bottom. So you didn't change the problem. So we're going to have cosine square A equals 169 over 169 minus 144 over 169. And then when you minus the numerators, you're going to have cosine square A equals 25 over 169. And then to get cosine by itself, you do the opposite of square, which is square root. So cosine A is going to be, don't forget, is it a plus or minus 5 over 13? All right? So is it a plus or is it a minus? Well, I have no idea. Let's go up. All right? We're going to go up and look at the constraints. Sine A I'm sorry, angle A is in quadrant 1. So if angle A is in quadrant 1, what is the sine of cosine in quadrant 1? All you just simply do is you can make your um, your coordinate system like this. And you remember the acronym, CAST or ALL students take calculus. This basically means that every all the trig functions are positive here, only sine. And is reciprocal or positive here? Only tan is reciprocal or positive here. And then only cosine and is reciprocal or positive here. So since everything is positive here, guess what? Cosine is positive. So that tells me that cosine A is 5 over 13. Okay? Because cosine is positive, sine is positive, tan is positive, and then cotangent, uh, secant, and cosecant, they are all positive, okay? That's what that, uh, that's what A means. A is for all, all right? Don't forget. All right, so cosine A is probably with 13. We're getting closer now. We have one piece together. Now we need to find the next piece, which is sine B, all right? To do, to find sine B, we're gonna do exactly what we just did, but we're going to be looking for the sine this time, and then uh, if we have any ambiguity with the sine, we just use all students to calculus to, to resolve that, all right? So to find sine, we're going to use the Pythagorean relationship. 
which relates sine and cosine. We know that sine square b in this case, the variable is b, that's what we're dealing with, plus cosine square b equals 1. All right, so I don't know what sine square b is, so I'm just going to leave sine square b alone. Cosine square b is going to be negative 3 over 5 square equals 1. I'm going to have sine square b plus 9 over 25 equals 1. Now, to get sine uh, square b by itself, I'm going to subtract 9 over 25 from both sides. Subtract that, subtract that. So I'm going to have uh, sine square b equals 1 over 1 minus 9 over 25. All right. So uh, times the top of 1 over 25, 25 and 25, because I need the LCD to be the same, which is 25. So we're going to have um, sine square b equals 25 minus 9 is 16, right? Equals 16 over 25. And then to get sine by itself, you take the square root of both sides. And then you have sine b, <coughs> because the opposite of square root is square root, square root right? So these and this cancel out equals plus or minus 4 over 5. All right, so what else? Is it positive or negative? Well, where is angle B? Angle B is in quadrant 2. So what does S mean? <clears throat> S means that sine is positive and its reciprocal, which is cosecant, positive. Guess what? Everything else, they're all negative in quadrant 2, okay? I didn't label my quadrants, pardon me. This is quadrant 1, this is quadrant 2, quadrant 3, and quadrant 4. All right, so since we're in quadrant 2 and B is positive, I'm sorry, since we're in quadrant 2, sine is positive. So sine B, we're going to just forget about the negative part and we're going to use sine B equals 4 over 5. All right, so sine B is 4 over 5. So we are now ready to generate, um, to generate cosine A minus B, okay? All right, so how do we do that? All we just need to do is we just plug in all this information we got into the formula, multiply them out, combine the fractions, and that's that. All right, so I'm going to rewrite the formula again so nobody gets confused. To rewrite the formula again, the formula is, uh, of the difference of um, the difference identity, cosine A minus B equals cosine A cosine B plus sine A sine B. Okay. Yes. Alright, so now let's substitute. Cosine A is what? 5 over 13 times cosine B is what? Negative 3 over 5 plus sine A is 12 over 13 sine, uh oh, yes. And then sine B is what? 4 over 5. Alright. Now let's work this out. Uh, if you multiply it out, you're going to get negative 15 over 65 minus 48 plus, sorry, 48 over 65. If you minus the numerator, you're going to end up with 33 over 65. And that's your final answer. So the answer to this is option one. Okay? All right. Now let's move on to question number 15. It says, which expression represents the third term in the expansion of 2x to the 4th minus y? Um, if you have extra time and a lot of energy, you can do this. You can multiply this out and figure out what the third term is. Okay? But we don't have time for that. We're going to use a shortcut, okay? So, what we're going to use, we're going to use Pascal's triangle, right? So, Pascal's triangle, we're going to the third row. So, this is row 0. Row 1 is 1, 1. So this is how you start out past post triangle, okay? 0 through first row, second row is 1, add these 2, 2, 1. Third row is 1, add these 2, 3, 3, 1. So these are the coefficients um, of the um, third term before we distribute whatever the inner coefficients are. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to line this up from top to bottom. 1, 3, 3, 1. All right, so now I'm going to take the first term inside, which is 2x to the 4th, 2x to the 4th, and I'm going to give it all the power. What is all the power? 3. 
And then I'll take the second term, which is negative y, and I'm going to give it, guess what, nothing, negative y, all right, to the zeroth power. So what's going to happen here is as I go down this continuum, the power starts to switch, all right? So I'm going to have 2x to the fourth raised to the second. This loses one power, and this gains it. And then 2x to the fourth loses another power, becomes 1. Negative y picks it up, becomes 2. And then 2x to the fourth becomes 0, and then negative y gains it to become 3. You notice what happened here? These powers are descending, and this power is increasing. But the powers always add up to uh, 3. Okay? Now it says, what is the third term? I don't need to do everything. I just need to focus my energy on the third term, which is this one right here. Okay? So let's work that out. So it's going to become 3 times 2 to the first times x to the fourth. So if I distribute this one first power to both of them, it doesn't change anything, right? Because 1 times anything is that thing. It's a multiplicative identity, right? So negative 2 square is negative, I mean negative y square is just y square because if you square, if you raise a negative value to an even number, that minus cancels out, right? Because you have minus y times minus y, which is just y squared. Okay? And now this becomes 6x to the 4th y squared. And your answer is option B. All right, moving along. Question 16, it says, what is the solution set to the equation 3x to the 5th minus 48? So we can do this by factoring. So we have 3x to the 5th minus 48x. So equals 0. So can I factor anything out of these two? Absolutely, I can factor out 3x, right? So if I factor out 3x, because as though I divide it, factor out 3x, I'm going to be left with x to the 4th minus uh, 16 equals 0. I hope what I did makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, just think about it. It's 3 times x times 5 of them, right? Minus 48. If you break down 48, what do you have? 2 times 24. 2 times 12, 2 times 6, 2 times 3, right? So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, you have uh, 4 twos, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 3. Kind of like on an X, huh? So you just take out a 3 and an X, take out a 3 and an X, so you have 3 X on the outside, those two are gone, bam, bam, and you're left with X to the 4, 2 times 2 is 4 times 2, 8 times 2, 16 minus 16. Okay, this is a real quick review on factor. That's what I did over here, right? So now let's factor this. How do you factor x to the fourth minus 16? This is a square, so the power is even. Any term with even power is a square, and this is also a square. So I'm going to employ the formula, the difference of squares formula, which you should have mastered. Um, the difference of squares formula tells me that if I have a square minus a square, it can be expressed as the sum and difference of the square roots, which is a plus b, a minus b, right? You just root the first and the last, and then you add and subtract them, right? So let's do that here. So if I want to factor this, I'm going to start so the roots the first term and the last term. So the roots perfect squared, right? Add and subtract them, okay? So you're going to have uh, 3x times x squared minus 4 times x squared minus 16. Sorry, uh, sorry. x squared minus 4 times x squared plus. Equals zero. Okay? The sum and the difference of the square roots. Because when you root, when you take the square root of x to the fourth, what you do is, what you're doing here is you're dividing the power by two, right? So the square root of x to the fourth is the same thing as x to the fourth raised to the one half. Let me write that again. The square root of x to the fourth is the same thing as um, x to the fourth raised to the one half, right? And then when you divide the power by two, you're just going to have x squared, right? And then the same thing with 16, when you take the square root of 16, 16, square root of 16, oh yeah, you already know that's plus that's not hard. All right, so you notice we ended up with another difference of squares here, so this can be factored further using the same principle. So we're going to have 3x, and then the same process, we have a difference of squares, so what I'm going to do is I'll root this, and root that, and I'll add and subtract my square root, so I'm going to have x minus 2 times x plus 2. This is a sum of squares. So please don't use this formula for this. It's a little bit different this one. All right, so x squared plus 4 equals 0. All right, so now it hasn't completely factored. We're going to use something called the ZPP, the zero product property, to finish this up, all right? 
So that tells me that if a product of terms equals zero, every single one of them has to be zero, right? So either 3x is zero, or yeah, x minus 2 is zero, or x plus 2 is zero, or this one right here, x squared plus 4 is zero. When I solve this, that should give me all my roots, all right? So this one, just simply divide by 3, x equals zero, and that's it, huh? <laughs> and this one, you add 2 to both sides, x equals 2, that goes one root, minus 2 from both sides, x equals negative 2, that's another root. This one, you subtract 4, you have x squared equals negative 4, and then you take the square root of both sides, and you're going to have x, wait a minute, when you square a negative number, you have an imaginary number, right? So you're going to have plus or minus, because you're taking the square root of a square, plus or minus 2i, okay? So there you have it. Okay, so if I want to organize my roots, I'm going to have my roots as x equals the O. Let's do the brackets, don't we? 0, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 2i. Now, there you have it. Alright, so the answer for this one is option number 3. That's my thing. Option 3. Alright, moving along to number 17. It says the full a, sequ a sequence has the following terms. Which of the following represents the nth term of a sequence? So first thing I want to do, let me write my sequence down here. Um, 4, 10, 25, 62.5. There two formulas for nth term. For the arithmetic, for the arithmetic, you have a n equals a1 plus n minus 1d. Okay? Now the end term of an arithmetic sequence, and then um, for a geometric sequence, geometric, you have a n equals a1 r to the n minus 1. So the question here is, what on earth is this? Is this geometric or is it arithmetic? All right, so arithmetic, you add all the time, you add or subtract, it is plus or minus. For geometric, either you're dividing or you're multiplying, right? So the question here is, do I keep adding or do I keep dividing or multiplying? Well, let's see. If we're adding, I add 6 to 4 to get 10, right? I add 6 to 4 to get 10 plus 6. If I add 6 to 10, do I get 25? Absolutely not. I get 16. So that tells me that it's not geometric. I mean, it's not arithmetic. So since it's not arithmetic, it's safe to assume that it's geometric, all right? So... Do you know how to check if it's geometric? Can you find a number that you keep multiplying by? Well, yeah, the comma ratio is that number, right? So the comma ratio is a2 over a1. If I divide a2 over a1 and I get the same thing as dividing a3 by a2, then that tells me it's geometric, right? So let's try that. This is a1, this is a2, this is a3. So if this divided by that is equal to this divided by that, then it is geometric. All right, a2 is 10. 10 divided by 4. It's 10 divided by 4 equals 2, 25 divided by 10. Well, let's reduce it and see. 2 goes here, 5, 2 goes here, 2. That's when you divide by 2. If you divide this by 5, you're going to have 5 over 2. Voila, it's geometric. Okay? So that means this is the formula we're going to be using. All right? So it's good to have um, all these formulas memorized because uh, I, I believe you're, you're not provided with... Um, the nth term formulas on your formula on your reference sheet. Let me, let me look at it real quick. On the reference sheet, I think they just gave you the sum formulas. Um, let's see. Oh boy, they didn't even give you anything. So, yeah, yeah, they just gave you the sum. Not as much. They gave you only the sum. They didn't give you the uh, nth term. So have this memorized, okay? All right. So this is the formula I'm using. So all I need is a one and a common ratio. To write down the nth term, all right? So what is a1? a1 is the first term. a1 is 4. The common ratio is a2 over a1, right? Or a3 over a2, it doesn't matter. We already did that, right? a2 over a1 is 10 over 4, which is reduces to 5 over 2, if you divide by 2, top and bottom, right? We just did that here. And remember, n for the nth term is just n. Don't try and be a class here, okay? Just leave n as n. All right, so your n term is going to become a1, which is 4, times the common ratio. You notice they all express as decimal, so 5 is the same thing as 2.5. So let's express that as a decimal, okay? I don't know why, but 2.5 raised to the n minus 1. 
final answer is four. Okay? All right, moving along. Question 18, it says parallelogram VFLO. In parallelogram VFLO, OL is 3.8, LF is 7.4, right graph angle O is 126. So the diagonal BL is drawn. Uh, what is the area of the track? Of the, what is the area of triangle BLF? So just remember that the area of a parallelogram formula, if you have SAS side angle side, area of a parallelogram is simply, um, it is either, you can have AB sine big A, or it could be, uh, yeah, AB sine big A, you have side angle side. So this could help you figure out what the area of the parallelogram is. Okay, um, it, that's in this case, if you have a parallelogram of this nature, let's see, this is the parallelogram right here, like this, okay. and this is A, this is B, B is like the base, okay, so sine A is like the height, all right, so um, the area of this, and then this is angle A, okay, so the area of this parallelogram is, the area is A, B, I'm sorry, it's A, B, sine a. It's based on its height, right? Because A, so this is the B is the base, and the height is A sine A. Okay, A sine A will help you find, figure out this height right here. So don't don't forget this is A sine A. So that's the height. This is base times height, it's just like a regular rectangle. You just tilt it to the side. Okay. So this is the formula for area of a parallelogram, just in case you didn't know. So let me sketch this parallelogram, and then we're gonna apply the measures that we provided with. And I use the, hopefully you can use this formula to figure out what it is, all right? So, for this triangle, let's label it first. It's BFLO, B, F, L, O. Uh, we're told that, um, we're told that, what are we told? Uh, OL is 3.8, well, is 3.8. Opposite sides are parallel and congruent, so this is 3.8 also. Um, LF 7.4, this is 7.4, and this side is also 7.4. Alright, so, what's the area of this? Well, we need to find the area of the whole thing before we find the area of the triangle, right? So, the area is, um, is based on type, right? So, I told you earlier that the base is 7.4. Now, what's the height? To find the height, I need to do, find this right here, all right? So you're told that measure of angle O is 126. So this is 126. For a parallelogram, adjacent angles are uh, are supplementary. So to find this, all I just have to do is subtract 126 from 180, right? Subtract that, this is geometry. So if you subtract that, um, 10, 4, 7, 5, 54. So this is going to be 54 degrees. All right, so this height is simply going to be 3.8 sine 54. You see how we did it over here? To get the height, it's just A sine whatever this angle is. So that's the height. So this times height, the height is 3.8 sine 54. All right? So that's the area of the whole parallelogram. So uh, let's see. We need a calculator to work this out. So, fire up the calculators. We are working in degrees here, so please make sure that your mode is set appropriately to degree, or else you get a wrong answer. So, 7.4 times 3.8 sine 54, and the answer is 22.74. That's the area of the parallelogram. 22.74. All right, let me let me make it 7.5, okay? So, 22.75 uh, is the area. So, is that our answer? Is the answer going to be, uh, let's go up. Is, it, is, it, is that the answer? Absolutely not, right? They asked for area of the triangle, okay? B, L, F. Not the whole parallelogram. We did the whole parallelogram, but what on earth is the area of the triangle? Well, if I draw the diagonal like this, what does that tell me? 
it tells me that the area of BFL, BLF is just simply half of the whole thing, right? Because I'm split, splitting it down the center. So to get the area of the triangle, area of the triangle, what you just do is you just divide this by 2. 2 to 7, 5 divided by 2, and that will give me the answer, right? So let's go back to the calculator. I'm just going to divide my answer by 2. 11.4 is the final answer, right? So the area of the triangle, which is half of the parallelogram, uh, is simply, well, it's kind of approximating because you're approximating here. Very careful. 11.4. All right, 11.4 square units. So our answer is going to be, it's not, a, it's not three, that's a good distractor right there, but the answer is actually one. All right, moving along. Question 19, it says, restatement about the graph of the equation, y equals e to the x is not true. There are two ways of doing this. You can sketch the graph by hand and examine it, or you can draw the graph in a calculator and look at a table of values. All right, so let me sketch the graph by hand because it's good to know how these graphs look like, right? Um, it's going to help you a lot when you get to advanced mathematics. The exponential function is the inverse of the natural logarithmic function. So it's something like this. All right, so let's see. Um, it says it's asymptotic with the x-axis, which means it gets really close to the x-axis without touching it. Is that the case? Absolutely. You can see the asymptotic behavior here. I'll show you in the calculator in a minute. It gets really close to the x-axis, but never gets to zero, all right? There's no number you can raise e to that actually gets you to zero. So this is good. The domain is a set of all real numbers. So how wide does, is the graph? How far do, to the left do you go, and how far to the right do you go? You know it goes on to the left forever and to the right forever. So what is that? That is a set of all real numbers. So this is good. It lies in quadrant one and two. Wait a minute. This is quadrant one. This is quadrant two. Quadrant three. Quadrant four. Is that the case? Absolutely. It lies only in the first two, so that's good. So by method of elimination, we can conclude that this is the wrong one, right? Well, let's see, though. This is telling me that it says it passes through the point E1. It tells me that if I plug in E for X, do I get 1 as my Y? Do I? Let's see. So Y um, equals E to the 1. Uh, I'm sorry. What am I plugging for Y? I'm plugging in X or Y, right? So e to the uh, e to the e e to the e okay because you know um, y equals e to the x right so we want to set x equals e we're going to plug in for uh, x we're going to plug in what are we going to plug in for x we're going to plug in e all right so i'm going to plug in e for x right here so that's what i do right here so i'm going to have y equals e to the e is e to the e1? Absolutely not. You know ln of e is 1, right? But e to the e is not 1. Let me just show you real quick. So if you turn on your calculators, uh, and then you go e to the e, i got to just delete this. Wait a minute. Oh boy. I, I need to go to my catalog. Let me see if I can find e over there. So go to my catalog. catalog. Wait a minute. You know one, one thing I can do? I, I think it's really easy. Let me do this. e to the e to the 1. e to the 1 is just e, right? So e to the 1 is e. Enter. There goes the answer. All right? So e to the e is not, um, e to the e is not 1. Okay? All right, let me, let me, let me show you using the calculator because this might look a little bit confusing. So I want to do e to the e, okay? So e to the e, so I can go to my catalog because I should have everything there. If I scroll down to the e, let me just go straight to E. If I go down to E, have E there. E to the E, close that, down, 15 point, same thing, okay? So to the E to the E is 15, is not 1. So that tells me that this is the wrong one. If I wanted to, if I forgot what this graph looked like, I can go to my calculator, press the Y option, and then I'll enter the function, CE right here. Second function, LN, we take it to E to the X, raise it to the X power. All right, because we're graphing this function, this function right here, as a function of graphing, and I hit graph. Yeah. You see how it looks very much like what we just sketched over here? So that's that's basically what the graph is, and then we can go. And if you look at a table, when, uh, oh, there's no E here. But you can guess, E is two points something, right? Um, so E is between these two, or I can, let me see, does it give me the option of entering E? 
Okay, enter, enter, um, let me see if I can enter E here. No, it doesn't let me. Uh, yeah. So there you have it. Calculate value. So, uh, I want to calculate a specific X value. Let me see if I can make this. So, try this out real quick. Try to log. Go down. And then I'm down, down, down. I'm looking for E. There goes E. And so when X is E, what is Y? 15.14. So you can even use your calculator to figure it out. Alright? So there you have it. Okay. Next, moving along. Oh wait, so answer is 4. Um, answer is option 4. Right here. Um, let's move along to last one. 20. What is the number of degrees in an angle whose measure is 2 radians? So when you're going from degrees to radians or radians to degrees, you just need to remember that pi radians uh, is equal to 180 degrees, right? So basically pi radians over 180 degrees is equal to 1. So if I multiply this by any angular measure, I don't change it, alright? If I reciprocate both sides, I can have 180 degrees over pi radians equal 1. So, if I want to convert 2 radians to degrees, 2 radians, okay? I'll put it as a fraction. The question is, one of these two conversion factors will suffice, okay? It's either option 1 or option 2. The option that I want is the one that actually cancels this radian. So which one will cancel the radian? It is the one that has radian on the bottom. Why? Because you have radian on the top. Okay? So I'm going to use option 2. I'm going to multiply this by 180 degrees over pi radians. Okay? Pi radians. Why did I do that? Because I want the radians canceling out. This radian and that radian cancels out. Now when I multiply across, I'm going to have 360 degrees over pi. Okay? Or you can write it in word form. It's 360 over pi degrees. That's your answer. Alright, so your answer is option one. Okay? So thank you so much for uh, paying attention to this presentation. Um, please uh, subscribe to my video so you can help support the production of more uh, clips like this and share with your friends so they can also benefit. Um, if, you, if you like the video, you can click like here and post a comment. I really appreciate it. Collection of clips can be found on my Thanks again and have a wonderful day.